as to exactly what anti-Semitism is. And um, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to go through all of them because it's, uh, it's a quite a lengthy topic. We could spend weeks and months and we have uh, an hour. So we're going to touch high points. We're going to speak about how to identify it and what to do about it. And we'll try to get some ideas. And what we want to do today is begin a discussion, not finish it. Now, Yad Vashem is involved in this. It would seem unnatural for Yad Vashem to be involved in anti-Semitism. But we're a museum. We're a school dedicated to the memory of the Holocaust. So why are we getting involved in, in this particular issue now? Well, of course, there's a, a, a desire for input, but mostly because we've been asked to get involved by victims. Gila Sechstein was a fighter in the Warsaw Ghetto, and uh, she survived, but she wrote to us, one of her last diary entries was, what can I say or ask for at this time while standing on the verge between life and death. More certain that I shall die than live. I wish to say goodbye to my friends and my work. I donate my work to the Jewish Museum that will be founded in the future in order to restore pre-war Jewish culture up until 1939 and to learn the terrible tragedy of the Jewish community in Poland during the war. I'm calm now, she writes. I'm destined to be killed. Be well, my dear friends. Be well, my Jewish people. And now she, 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 she commands us, never allow such destruction to happen again. Well, everything that happened in the war happened as an outflowing of an ancient hate. And let's just take a, a look and get a little bit of context in history. According to a recent report, hate crimes are up in most major cities with Jews suffering the highest percentage of any group. Here's Meg Oliver. Jews will not replace us! Jews will not replace us! The kids are being targeted simply because they're Jewish. This is where someone plastered hateful graffiti. America in 2018 is grappling with the virulent rise of anti-Semitism. Saturday's attack in Pittsburgh comes after a year that has seen a sharp uptick in bomb threats, anti-Semitic rallies, social media threats, and spray-painted swastikas on synagogues targeted at Jewish Americans. To bring it to the place where we pray is deeply, deeply upsetting. Jonathan Greenblatt with the Anti-Defamation League noted a 57% increase in anti-Semitic incidents nationwide last year compared to 2016. That's the biggest spike since 1979. Those incidents occurred in every state in 2017 for the first time in seven years. What changed? I think our polarized environment, we see people you know, bringing a kind of toxicity into the political conversations we've just never seen before. FBI stats show in 2016, more than one in five hate crimes were prompted by religious bias. Out of those 1,538 offenses, more than half were anti-Jewish. That's far more than hate crimes targeting Muslims, Catholics, or any other religious group. There's just so much hate speech right now that we, so much tribalism, so little coming together that we, we need to focus on that. The ADL also just released a report that showed social media harassment targeting Jewish Americans has increased around the midterm elections. And Jeff, two thirds of those online attacks were from people, not bots. Meg Oliver, thanks very much. Well, this is from 2018. The truth of the matter is, uh, I, I, I don't have the ability, the time to update it. Every day there's a new incident. The one difference between now and then is, is then the, the, perhaps it was because Pittsburgh, be, 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 perhaps it was because of the, of the so many different things that were happening, but it made the CBS evening news. Unfortunately, today there's been an habituation. And in fact, it doesn't really make the news anymore. So this establishes 
where we're at in, 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 in our lives now. Anti-Semitism is part and parcel of the communities in which we live in, the reality that, that we function in, and the world that our children and grandchildren are being raised in. Anti-Semitism exists, we know that. So the goal of this, of this evening, of this morning, is the following. We, are, we want to identify traditional new forms of anti-Semitic expressions. We want to suggest possible responses on a communal level. We want to suggest possible responses on a personal level. But we have to make an important disclaimer. There's something you have to know because we are Yad Vashem. And people turn to us and they're saying, is another Holocaust coming? Is, is this one another Hitler? Is this how the Nazis started? Are we, are we on the road to another Holocaust? So the Holocaust is not a crystal ball that will allow us to identify future waves of anti-Semitism. I, I don't know what tomorrow will hold or the signs of an impending future Holocaust, God forbid. We, 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 can, we, can, we can learn from the past, but we can't predict the future. Who the next Hitler will be or how to absolutely eradicate hate from the world. The Holocaust give us these answers. The Holocaust sensitizes us to something that happened in the past. The Holocaust makes us aware, but the Holocaust cannot forewarn us of future tragedy. What is anti-Semitism? And is any expression against Jews or Israel anti-Semitic? In other words, what is a legitimate expression of anti-Semitism? What is a legitimate expression of anti-Israel? I'm against Israel. I don't politically disagree with Israel. And an expression of anti-Semitism. So we have to know that hostility towards Jews is not simply one prejudice among many, but it's something unique. It's unique because it has its origins in a moral and conceptual interpretation of the world. Hatred of Jews does not mean hatred of a specified other, of something clearly foreign, but of an alleged evil in the world. All forms ultimately hark back to this conceptualization, which divides the world into right and wrong. Anti-Semitism is an expression of moral indignation. And you can see it, it, it has its roots, modern anti-Semitism, uh, even ancient to a certain degree has its roots in the church and church philosophy. And this can be seen very clearly when you look at two figures, two statues, that exist on the outside of Notre Dame in Paris. One, the stately woman wearing a crown and holding a cross, right, and a chalice. She's, her name is Synagoga. Her name is Ecclesiasta, excuse me. The broken, the, the girl wearing a blindfold and looking down with a broken staff, her name is Synagoga. And you have the two of them clearly representing the rise of the moral and, and accepted morality of Ecclesiasta facing the, the broken and rejected morality of synagogue, the rise of the church and the fall of the synagogue, right? And that's because the synagogue represents a, moral, a morally reprehensible institution. It represents deicide. It represents a rejection of God and goodness, whereas the church represents the future, goodness, acceptance, all that's good in the world, and the synagogue, Judaism, all that's bad. Anti-Semitism, without centuries of this persistent hatred, the Third Reich, would not have found it possible to mobilize hundreds of thousands of people to despise, scapegoat, and ultimately participate in the murder of European Jewry. Please let's remember, there was approximately 360, 400,000 Jews in Germany that represented, a, there was 60 million Germans. So this represented less than 1%. Most people had never seen a Jew. Most people had never met a Jew. 
They've never spoken to a Jew. There was no Jewish community in their, in their, in their small cities, in their hamlets. Yet, they, they accepted immediately the premise that the Jews are poisoning society, that all of the ills that were, that were facing German society were the fault of the Jews. Why is that? So Deborah Lichtstadt points out, she says it's because they had been desensitized. The Jews had been dehumanized for generations. The, the, the image that I showed you on Notre Dame is already a gentler image than the images that can be found on many, many churches, including Martin Luther's church, of the most vile imagery against Judaism. And they had become accustomed to the idea that Jews are evil, even though they themselves had never met a Jew. Jews, in reality, were not the problem. But the mythic Jew, the Jew that had been created, that became the problem. And the Nazis simply focused all of, all of the Reich's problems from that imagery onto a certain reality. Throughout history, anti-Semitism has taken on different forms, but it's always affected by the time and place in which it occurs. Different cultures, beliefs, events shape anti-Semitism, but throughout history, there are also salient elements that always repeat themselves. For instance, Jews have been blamed for being in league with the devil. In the Middle Ages, they were blamed for the Black Death and for poisoning wells. In certain places, entire communities were burned to death, even when the Pope came out against those accusations. In blood libels against the Jews that began in the Middle Ages and continue even today, the demonic image of the Jew recurs and the Jew is accused of using the blood of non-Jewish victims in Jewish religious rituals. Treason and treachery have been associated with the Jews throughout history, so that from the beginnings of Christianity, the Jews were blamed for betraying Jesus to the Romans, an accusation that was only officially retracted by the Catholic Church after the Holocaust. In a trial that took place in 19th century France, Alfred Dreyfus, a Jewish officer in the French army, was accused of espionage and betraying his homeland. Ultimately, he was found innocent and all those allegations were proven to be lies. During the Weimar Republic, the Jews as a group were accused of being unpatriotic. Even worse, they were accused of stabbing Germany in the back and plotting to bring about her military defeat, even though 100,000 of them served as officers and soldiers in the German army, and 12,000 Jews were killed fighting for their country. In the 20th century, the Jews were accused of being a demonic force that poisoned the world with conflicting ideas such as exploitative capitalism and communism. There are many other examples of accusations that have been made against the Jews based on social, religious, or historical circumstances that repeat themselves. For instance, Jews are always accused of caring only about money, They're accused of conspiracy. And they're always accused of plotting to take over the world. This morning, this morning in the Jerusalem Post, they had a picture, a headline from a Polish, a Polish language newspaper blaming the coronavirus on the Jews. Nothing's changed and everything has changed. What's a stereotype? Much of anti-Semitism is based on stereotypes, preconceived ideas that are not analyzed, that are not really thought out, that have taken root, have become part of popular lore, and that we identify and recognize as anti-Jewish, even though they're not true, they have no basis in reality. But a stereotype is an oversimplified generalization about a person or a group of people. Why do people stereotype? And what is the danger in stereotyping? Why do people stereotype? Because it allows them to create in a world a place for themselves by quickly identifying others. 
In other words, I'm good, they're bad. Why? Because of this, this, and this. I don't have to think about it. I don't need facts. I don't need anything, anything other than my gut feeling. What's the danger? Exactly that. You're not dealing with facts. You're dealing with a gut feeling that can often be wrong, that has no basis in reality, and that is completely the result of social lies that have now become communal norms. What's examples of stereotypes and accusations made against Jews? And, and, and we, let's go through them and I'll point out where they come from. Stubborn people who are unwilling to assimilate into society as a whole. The, the, the refusal to accept Jesus. In league with the devil. As we mentioned before, all things bad. Outsiders. Their Sabbath is Sunday, ours is Saturday. We don't eat the same food they do. We have different holidays. Care only for money because uh, there was a long period of time where Jews could be involved in no other business but money lending due to restrictions in Christianity. They engage in shady business practices, causes of disease and death, the black death, the other. It can't be us. We're good people. Why is God punishing us? It must be them. Jews use the blood of Christians for ritual purposes in order to amass hate and fear, plotting to take over the world. Why? Because uh, this was key in the Dreyfus trial, right? Jews have family, right? One of you is speaking to your granddaughter in South Korea. There's Jews everywhere, right? And that, and that is, is, is an example of, of how the Jews are taking over the world. Unpatriotic. The Jews are constantly accused of dual loyalty because of Israel. The worst race, strong yet very dangerous. The Nazis that compared us to rats, cockroaches. We're there, you can't get rid of us, but we're dangerous and revulsion. If you're a capitalist, so the Jews are behind Bolshevism because many early communists were Jewish because they thought that making everyone equal, right, the, the rise of the proletariat, where everybody would be treated the same, would be an end to anti-Semitism. But if you're a communist, then Jews are capitalists, the Rothschilds and the, and the, the, the great Jewish families that were successful in, in, the Western, in, in the Western world. Democracy and anarchy, right? Jews, if you're, the Nazis accused the Jews of anarchy, the very essence of their philosophy of ordinal, of, of being, uh, have an orderly, orderly society, the Jews were against that. And, and um, uh, those who are in America, for example, right, now the Jews are anti-democratic. So whatever you hate is the, is, becomes the stereotype of the Jew. Let's take a look at classic stereotypes, right? In our top left-hand quarter, you have a snake in a, in a Magen David, a Jewish star with Arabic writing. This is new. The Arabics never, the Arabs never had things like this until after the war, but it's revulsive. We're afraid of snakes, right? Snakes are dangerous and we're associating it with the Jew, right? Below that, you have the internet, Mark Zuckerberg, a Jew, and you see a, an octopus. He, we know that it's a Jew because of the big nose, the curly hair. It's clearly a characterization of Zucker, uh, Mark Zuckerman. And, and, and you see the octopus has the tentacles throughout the internet controlling the world. Next to that is the Jew, happy, smiling, placed over gold. And the, the, the most bizarre one, in my opinion, is the Harvard Law Record that says, and this is, this is a true thing that happened, at the question and answer section of an event last Thursday, a Harvard Law student, a Harvard Law School student asked Jewish Israeli dignitary, Tzipi Livni, how is it that you're so smelly? A question about the odor of Mrs. Tzipi Livni. She's very sm smelly, and I was just wondering. Right, because Jews are dirty, Jews are filthy, and and here you had it in a Harvard Law School. So you see, these classic anti-Semitism is very much alive today. How can anti-Zionism be the new anti-Semitism? 
Surely there's no connection between them. Anti-Semitism is hatred of Jews as a people, a race, an ethnic group. Anti-Zionism is an objection to a country, a nation, a state. What's the connection between them? Anti-Semitism is a virus that mutates, so that new anti-Semites can deny that they're anti-Semites at all, because their hate is different from the old. In the Middle Ages, Jews were hated for their religion. In the 19th and early 20th century, they were hated for their race. Today, they are hated for their nation state, Israel. What all three have in common is that there are different ways of saying that Jews have no right to exist collectively as Jews with the same rights as other human beings. In each era, anti-Semitism has focused on the primary form of collective Jewish existence. In the Middle Ages, they were a religious community, so they were hated for their religion. In the 19th century, when many European Jews became secular, they formed an ethnic group, a race, and were hated as such. Today, when their primary collective embodiment is as the people of Israel in the state of Israel, they are hated for their state. Anti-Zionism is the latest mutation of the world's longest hate. So, uh, Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, who produced this short piece, he, his contention is, is that anti-Zionism, in most instances, is anti-Semitism recloaked. Now, we have to think of if, in fact, that holds up, but that's his contention. So let's examine that for a minute. The Middle East conflict is part of, is part of the anti-Semitic discourse. So let's take a look. Here you have a picture of a young lady, looks like a normal young lady, holding a sign that says, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Now, that seems to me to be a legitimate example of political discourse, until you stop and think about it. The river is the Jordan River. It's the, the eastern border of Israel. The sea is the Mediterranean Sea. That's the Western border. So the, the question now is, where will Israel exist? If the river and the sea will be Palestine and it'll be free of Jews, where will the Jews exist? So this is really not a call for a Palestinian state. This is a call for the annihilation of the Jewish people, of Israel. But this wouldn't, you have to know your facts and you have to, see the context from which it's coming. What do we have here? We have Gaza, right? This is from a, a French. We have Gaza and we have Arbeit Macht Frei. But again, if you don't know that Arbeit Macht Frei was the wording at the entrance to concentration camps, and if you don't know that the Holocaust took place, then you might think this is a legitimate expression, but it's not. It's saying that's what's happening in Gaza is, is another Holocaust. Just like the Jews were massacred, men, women, and children were gassed and burned, that's what's happening in Gaza. That is not what's happening in Gaza. No one is being gassed. No one is being burned. What they are experiencing is the persecution of their own government and the inconvenience when they come into Israel to work, etc. They're held up. It's not comfortable. I don't think I would want it to happen to me, but that's the result of a fear. But there is no Holocaust-like persecution going, in, going on in Gaza. And lastly, you have what, what might seem an innocuous caricature. This, in fact, is from the World War II era, and it's the picture of the wandering Jew. A Jew has no place, has no home has no right to live in any particular place. So you see that even though the discussion has moved towards Israel, there is a strong use of classic anti-Semitism imagery, delegitimizing Israel and conspiring to take over the world. Here's more modern examples. Here you have Israel kills, okay. Let's say that's an, why is that not a legitimate expression? There's wars going on and, and 
and uh, the people who Israel is making war with are killed. So maybe it's a true statement. Maybe, but it becomes anti-Semitic the second the S's are turned into dollar signs. Because now it's not an expression of a point of view, but it's once again an attempt to give the impression that everything a Jew does is for money. Here you have the new Israel mass deportation rules, mass deportation, like, like uh, World War II when, when, when Jews were kicked out of countries, right? They were, they, were, they were, if you will, swept out, but that's neither accurate nor is it correct, right? Jew, Arabs are not kicked out of Israel. There's uh, uh, millions of Arabs in Israel. There's Supreme Court justices who are Arabs. There's the, the second single largest political party in the Knesset is Arab. Arabs are not being swept away. They're not being uh, um, uh, kicked out of Israel. There's a conflict. There's a, a disagreement. But, but this is an inaccurate commentary that's attempting to pay paint the Israelis to be like Nazis. Beneath that, you have classic anti-Semitism. The Jew, I know it's a Jew because the person wearing the bib has a Star of David on his bib, and he is killing Palestinian children and drinking their blood. A barbaric, untrue, uncivilized, baseless accusation meant simply to inspire hate. And here you have a picture of the president of the Palestinian Authority, Mahmoud Abbas, who made a speech at the European Union in which he accused the Jews of poisoning the water, the wells that, that feed the Palestinian people. False, 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 but tapping into stereotypes that are immediately recognizable and establish a certain norm that the in this case by they were in in um, they were uh, taken from Europe blood libels poisoning the wells Israel is perceived as the collective Jew the ultimate evil so here you have an example right the Jewish community in France was warned ahead of time of the 1113 terror attacks in the kosher uh, in the kosher um, supermarket, etc. right? That's because the ultimate evil, ISIS, is really Jewish, because all evil is Jewish. You have a picture of Bibi Netanyahu, who when you peel away the mask of civilized human being, is simply ISS, because ISS is the evil of the time, and therefore it must be Jewish. You have the blood-sucking mosquito, torturing and hurting the Palestinian child. And lastly, you have uh, in league with the devil, right? The devil represented by the, the grim reaper and Netanyahu standing with uh, Hitler and uh, the head of the Muslim Brotherhood. The real play, the Jews are a vile, disgusting animal that poisons society and discuss people, but we have trouble getting rid of it. Every Jew is identifying with Israel. Again, all Jews are the same. So here you have two interesting cases. You have the singer uh, Matasyahu, right? He's a rapper, he he's, has nothing to do with Israel. But the BDS campaign pressured to cancel his performance of the Jewish rapper Matasyahu because he was Jewish. He had, BDS is an anti-Israel campaign, right? Boycott, divest, and sanction. That's uh, something they want to do to create political pressure on Israel. But it really is a guise for anti-Semitism. Why do I say that? Because you see, they canceled the rapper, not because, of the, he, because he was Jewish. He has no political views per se. Right, and if they do, if he does, they're private, and he's not a representative. He's not a spokesman for Israel anyway. In Chicago, there was a pink washing. What was that? Violently interrupts the presentation of the Israeli representatives of the LGBT conference. Right, there were Israelis uh, who went to support the LGBT movement, and they were booed down. 
not because uh, their stance in relationship to, they weren't there for Israel. They had really nothing to do with Israel other than that's where they came from. They were there because they wanted to support the LGBT march that took place in Chicago in 2016. And they were precluded because they were Jewish and all Jews support Israel. We have uh, the Holocaust has now been politicized as part of the anti-Semitic discourse. What do you have here? You have a case of Jews who are only concerned about money in a snowball, where if you shake it, instead of snow, it's dollars behind the background of the famed on entrance to Birkenau. And the, the implication is that the Holocaust is just another Jewish trick to make money. You have the same thing by the cash register. You have that uh, image of the entrance to Birkenau and the number six million, just the way for Jews to make cash. Maybe it didn't even happen because Jews only care for money and they engage in shady business practices. They have no problem cheating you by playing on your sympathies. Here you have the inversion. Israel are the new Nazis and the Palestinians are the new Jews. So here you have a case of a boy in the Warsaw ghetto who's being pulled out of a bunker and he will his death and a boy who was throwing rocks being taken by Israeli soldiers away from the rock throwing. It's a terrible comparison. You have the same comparison here in a cartoon. Jew being faced by the Nazi and the Palestinian boy being faced by the Jew. Stop doing, the sign says. That what Hitler did to you. And of course, in mimicking the numbers that were tattooed in the arms of victims at Birkenau. And it's 1948, the year that it was established. These are all anti-Semitic tropes that are made to influence without fact, without reason, the Arab-Israel conflict. Israel has the Reich to defend itself. Pretty self-explanatory. And this is one that was very recent in the New York Times. So if we analyze this, what's the problem? You have a President Trump being led, a blind Trump being led by a dog that looks like Netanyahu. And around his neck is the Star of David, which is the symbol of the state of Israel. So why isn't this a legitimate form of political expression? Because Trump is wearing a kippah. Trump is not Jewish. He does not wear a kippah. But by putting a kippah on him, it's giving the, in, the implication that he is a puppet of the international Jewish world domination. And that's why he is supportive of Israel. It's a subtle but anti-Semitic cartoon. Now, Muslim anti-Semitism is fairly new. It uses classic anti-Semitic anti stereotypes with Muslim aspects added in. It's using the Holocaust, anti-Americanism, anti-globalization, frustration of young Arab immigrants in Europe. All the problems that the Muslim community is facing now, there's an attempt to blame on the Jews. So here you have... Uh, uh, from the Holocaust, they're hung up on barbed wire never again, and the Arabs, same thing, over again. You, you have the, the can't get enough of Palestinian blood, the protocols of the elders of Zion in Arabic, and the, the rats, the Jewish rats, attempting to take over a holy site in Islam. These are all images that are new that only came to the Arab world after World War II when Nazis ran for protection to certain Arab countries. Victimization, the, the Muslims are the new Jews. Universalization, if Anne Frank were alive, she would be a Palestinian. And decontextualizing, the, the destruction of Dresden, 
which was a war, a, a war uh, part of World War II. The Allies bombed Dresden because it had in it armaments that were placed in the city close to civilian populations. And when they, there was a tremendous uh, hellfire in Dresden. But that's a far cry from gassing men, women, and children in a concentration camp who were not combatants in any war. You have, uh, you know, as recently as two days ago, you have a, an Arab terrorist group's stash of explosives blew up in Beirut, causing hundreds of people to, to die and thousands of people to be homeless and and uh, in shock and suffering terribly, right? Uh, and that has already been blamed on the Jews. That's already been, been characterized as an attempt of, of Israel to attack the Arab communities. Anti-Semitism is not a Jewish problem. After all. After all, if we're not Jewish, what has it got to do with us? The answer is that anti-Semitism is about the inability of a group to make space for difference. And because we're all different, the hate that begins with Jews never ends with Jews. It wasn't Jews alone who suffered under Hitler. It wasn't Jews alone who suffered under Stalin. It isn't Jews alone who suffer under the radical Islamists and others who deny Israel's right to exist. Anti-Semitism is the world's most reliable early warning sign of a major threat to freedom, humanity, and the dignity of difference. It matters to all of us, which is why we must fight it together. Anti-Semitism is not a Jewish problem. We are the victims of anti-Semitism, but it's a societal problem. It's an ancient hate that has become a societal norm. So if that's the case, what can we do about it? What can we do to fight anti-Semitism? Well, first of all, we need to be able to identify it. So I've showed you pictures, but there are sort of practical tests. This is called the 3D test. It was made famous by... Um, Um, Anatoly Sharansky, I apologize. Here it's already in the evening. It's been a long day. Demonization, the first D. When the Jewish state is being demonized, when Israel actions are blown out of all sensible proportion, when comparisons are made between Israelis and Nazis and between Palestinian refugee camps and Auschwitz, this is anti-Semitism not legitimate criticism of Israel, because it's not true. And it's tapping into the, even the worst of the refugee camps are not concentration camps. They're just not. Double standards. When criticism of Israel is applied selectively, when Israel is singled out by the United Nations for human rights abuses, while the behavior of known and major abusers, such as China, Iran, Cuba, and Syria is ignored, when Israel's Magen David Adom alone among the world's ambulance services denied admission to the International Red Cross, this is anti-Semitism. Every single month, the United Nations discusses the plight of the Palestinians in Israel, right? The plight the fact that they have to wait in line to get to their jobs, et cetera, et cetera. There's a constant, ongoing um, I, uh, uh, agenda item in the United Nations. But when, last year, Syria gassed its own people, there wasn't a word. There wasn't a word. That's anti-Semitism. When Israel's fundamental right to exist is denied, alone among all peoples in the world, this too is anti-Semitism. We have a right to have a homeland. We have a right to exist. The IHRA, National Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, which is that international group 
that is trying to define anti-Semitism for the purpose of law. In other words, how if, we, if we're going to make anti-Semitic trope illegal, how do you do that? So in the United States, many states have adopted this definition, and it's an ongoing right It's a big discussion in England. The Labour Party, at least part of the Labour Party, is attempting to deny the legitimacy of this definition, while the other part of it wants to accept it so there can be clear definitions of what is and what isn't anti-Semitism. Denying the Jewish people the right to self-determination by claiming the state of Israel is a racist endeavor. Applying double standards by requiring of it a behavior not expected or demanded of any other democratic nation. Using the symbols and images associated with classic anti-Semitism, claims of Jews killing Jesus or blood libel to characterize Israel or Israelis, and drawing comparisons of contemporary Israeli society to that of the Nazis. This is the working definition of anti-Semitism, and this is what is being debated in many of the houses, legislative houses around the world today. How do you fight it? So first of all, you fight it by being active in your community. You have to be an active part of not just the Jewish community, but the community at large, because anti-Semitism is not just a Jewish problem. We have to engage our fellow community members, Jewish and not Jewish. Vote, vote, and vote again. <laughs> I'm just joking. Everyone needs to vote, because by putting in the people who will represent your interest, you are are exercising one of the most fundamental rights of being a citizen of the great United States of America. Call the police if you encounter anti-Semitism that you feel poses an immediate danger, right? Uh, a four-year-old kid, right, that, that says a naughty poem about Jews might be an immediate danger. But a group of teenagers who are smoking and throwing rocks might be. Call the police. Don't deal with it yourself. Join community pro protests against anti-Semitism. If there's a protest because of a commercial or because of a street sign or because of something someone said, go to it, support it, make sure that it's successful. Write your community representatives to protest any and all anti-Semitic displays in your community. You don't have to tolerate it. You're a member of the community, write the letter. Respond to anti-Semitism anti wherever you encounter it, in schools and on campus, in your children's school, in your, in your grandchildren's school. If you read about it, a professor who is stepping way out of line, respond to it, write a letter, call in the malls, in the newspapers and magazines, online and Facebook and other social media outlets. When people respond to hate, others will, will do something about it. We see that even on places like Facebook. We see that in, in many social media outlets that they're not tolerating it. So change is occurring slower than we like maybe, but nevertheless, change is securing. Now, here's an example of what one community, not a Jewish community did when they suffered anti-Semitism. This is Billings, Montana. When winter a few years ago, the people here found some simple ways to draw together by taking a stand against hate and intolerance. We told their story in a PBS special called Not In Our Town. Their actions inspired communities all over the country to do the same. When hate happens or someone is attacked or a church is burned, respond. Hate crimes happen every day in this country, but they're often ignored. The people of Billings, Montana decided not to look the other way. And here's what they did that inspired other communities to do the same. When a Native American family's home was defaced with racist graffiti, 30 members of the painters union showed up to paint over it. So many of the times there's a cause and I end up standing on the sidelines too much. I would feel something, but I never really did a lot to do anything about anything. And I was really glad to help paint the house, more so to help convey a message to these guys that the community will not stand for that. Dear, dear
when services at an African American church were disrupted by skinheads, members of other religious denominations from throughout Billings attended to help secure the church. Denomination didn't count, ethnic background didn't count, color skin didn't count. It was just that we were one people in it all together as one, and they did rally around, let them know, hey, if you bite one, you bite us all. Billings Police Chief Wayne Inman took a strong stand against the hate crimes and became actively involved in the community's response. If a police chief doesn't take a visible and active role, then there's an assumption that everything is all right. And these hate groups have learned through experience that if a community doesn't respond, then the community accepts. Silence is acceptance to them. Hate flyers were posted near the synagogue, and the Jewish cemetery was desecrated. Then, a brick was thrown through the bedroom window of a six-year-old boy who had placed a menorah there for Hanukkah. I, I remember discussing it with the publisher of the Gazette the next morning after this had happened and saying that please make this front page news because I want people to understand what it's like to be Jewish. I guess it was a question of looking for an image that kind of put this together. During the Second World War, the Danish king is reputed to have come out after the uh, Jewish community there was forced to wear stars by the Nazi occupiers, that he was reported to have come out with a, uh, with a yellow star too. The Billings Gazette printed a full page menorah for townspeople to tear out and hang in their windows. The good thing about this town is that everybody said that one day, let's get together. So what we're gonna do is put menorahs in our windows and pretty soon, Everybody we knew had one. By late December, nearly 10,000 people in Billings, Montana had menorahs in their windows. I would like to have thought that um, if, if this had happened to my Native American community, that they would have put a Native American symbol in their window. If it happened to the um, uh, gay and lesbian community, that they would have put a pink triangle in their window. I would have liked to have, have hoped or think that they would have done that. There is great goodness in the world, but we need permission and ways to, to reach out. I mean, after all, these are our neighbors. If somebody threw a brick through your neighbor's house in Montana, you run out there and try to stop them. Don't they do that anywhere else in the country? In this particular case, I think the best part of it surfaced. I was very proud of Millings for that. Just one tiny candle we lit, and it wasn't much, but that was something. I really liked Billings, Montana a lot. Life seemed, I don't know, simpler here. I don't mean simpler like not as smart or less sophisticated. I mean more straightforward. You know, it's been called the all-American city. You gotta like that. Especially if you think that America is a place where ordinary citizens will put themselves on the front lines to fight the everyday battle against intolerance. And I'm not sure it's a war that will ever be won without Without the Bob Maxwells and the Sarah Anthonys and the Reverend Freemans, it surely will be lost. Today, not in our town. Tomorrow, not in our country. It's a nice thought. A true story, Billings, Montana. Really a, 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 uh, a really a, a motivating story, but this is the goal. This is the goal to mobilize our communities to fight something that's intolerable, intolerable to all good people. So we began by pointing out that the Holocaust is not a crystal ball. What will allow us to identify future waves of anti-Semitism? That the Holocaust will not allow us to identify future waves of anti-Semitism or the signs of an impending future Holocaust, God forbid, or who the next Hitler will be, or how to absolutely eradicate hate from the world. So how is the study of Holocaust 
relevant to our lives. Holocaust was an absolute evil. Captain G.M. Gilbert, who was a psychologist with the United States Army in Nuremberg, was tasked with interviewing uh, the 10 um, Nazis who were on trial at Nuremberg. And while he was doing that, he was also writing his PhD on hate. And he was looking for the source of hate. And he wrote, in my work with defendants at the Nuremberg trials 45 to 49, I was searching for the nature of evil. And now I think I've come close to defining it. A lack of empathy. It's the one characteristic that connects all the defendants, a genuine incapacity to feel with their fellow man. Evil, I think, is the absence of empathy. Empathy is the ability to feel another's pain, to come out of yourself and relate in a deep way to another. You can't do that. If you, you can't do that if you don't ascribe to the other the same emotions and needs and desires and humanity that you ascribe to yourself. So perhaps one of the things that we can do in order to eradicate anti-Semitism in addition to on a communal level, but as a, on a personal level, we have to work to create within ourselves empathy to those who are different than us. Empathy is the ability to understand and share the feelings of another. Study the Holocaust properly, and it will help us create empathy in ourselves. We will be better people. And let us conclude with the words of Ellie Wee. And so we go to the museum. And what should we do? Weep? No. My good friends, we never try to tell the tale to make people weep. It's too easy. Tale. It is because we wanted the world to be a better world. Just a better world. And learn and remember what is our role. We must become the messengers, messengers. We at Yad Vashem are dedicated to not forgetting the Shoah, the Holocaust, because our experience in the Shoah, the Jewish collective memory, our experience in the Shoah and the Holocaust will remind us to have empathy to others, will remind us of how bad hate can be, will remind us of what it's like to be excluded, will remind us of how important it is that we look beyond stereotypes and see people, real people. And if we can educate our neighbors to be intolerant of anti-Semitism, not because they're going to get rich and not because, but because anti-Semitism is a form of dehumanization and the world will be a better place if we can get rid of dehumanization. So that's our presentation today on anti-Semitism to try to answer them. Thank you very much, Rabbi. Um, there are a few questions in the chat box, and I'm sure people would also like to engage in a few minutes of conversation. Um, so I'll look at the read chat. the questions, or if you want to read them yourself. Well, you go quicker if you ask them because otherwise I have to find them and read them. Okay. Susie, will you record? Okay. That's not Yep. <laughs> so I will, I'll read them. Um, we have one question from Helena Shanser. Is hate to other religions, Islam or races, blacks, a danger for eventual hate against Jews? 
If so, should Jews and Israel fight morally those regimes? Yes, yes, and yes. And then um, from Ben Muskin, uh, he ha actually had two questions. The first is, is it concerning that this morning's participants are almost all over 60? Is this normal and typical audience? How differently do Jewish age groups perceive the Holocaust and anti-Semitism? Is this concerning? So far, since Karnovis participants, the vast majority of them around in different countries are young people, 18, 20, 25, et cetera. Sometimes, right, especially after a hurricane, right, um, people who have more time perhaps will be more likely to tune in. Is it a concern? It's your community. It might be. You have to decide that. And next time you have a class, not with me, but with anybody, just simply reach out, invite uh, one of your grandchildren or invite one of your children or invite a neighbor to participate and and you know that that might resolve the issue but in in general uh i speak to all people not more elderly or more young uh, it's across the boards and then um the second of his questions is uh where progress has been made or where hope exists? And if it's been made in some areas, what lessons can we learn and we apply them? Well, you see, for example, on Facebook, anti-Semitic anti tropes are being disallowed. So that's certainly progress. And I think that just speaks to everything we spoke about, that if a community objects and, and they develop a broad um, support for their contentions that anti-Semitic uh, language or or information is being is present on on a social media that you can get it changed, right? Uh, in in hate speech is disallowed, right? Uh, you know, uh, maybe some of us can remember Father, you know, Conklin, right? The from Detroit who used to have terrible anti-Semitic but it, was un it yes. became unacceptable. So we have to keep up pressure on our community. We have to constantly protest if the need arises. And yes, I think we can see success. And we, we have, and we will continue to. What's disheartening is not that we can't change what exists. What's disheartening is that more and more things seem to, to be coming up, more and more venues for anti-Semitic expression are cropping up. It's becoming more socially accepted. So we have to fight back that much harder. Ken, do you want to ask your own question? Sure. Um, you, you made a lot of good points, uh, Rabbi, but one question that I have um, is what, can you give me an example of legitimate criticism of Israel. In other words, um, what I'm concerned about as an American Jew um, is it can't possibly be a situation where one can never criticize uh, the practices of the Israeli government. There must be some legitimacy uh, that you can give me an example of. Okay, and, I'm gonna give you an example right now. Sure. Hold on. I'm waiting for it to come up. Huh? Okay. Hold on one second. Hold on, hang with me. Okay, now I want to share again. Oh, 
Hold on, I'm sorry. Okay, here we go. Stay with me for one second. Sure. And I'm going to share my screen again. Okay, do you see my screen now? Yes. yes. Okay, this is, this is an example of an anti-Israel cartoon that I, is not anti-Semitic. Settlement, 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 settlement. Peace talks, no settlement. It's a political commentary that, that takes a jab at Israel, but, it, it, and it's, I would say it, you know, it's certainly not pro-Israel, but it's also not anti-Semitic. There's no anti-Semitic tropes. There's no Jews with big noses. No uh, dollar sign, Nazi Holocaust imagery. This is an example. Yeah, I, I can see your point of view. Um, the concern I have, which uh, I think might be shared by many, is and when I talk to my son about this, or my sons, um, you know, their position is that uh, Israel is Israel, the U.S. is the U.S., and um, they see themselves as part of a religion, which I have uh, taken a position that we are more, much more than a religion. We are a people, a people with a long historical tradition. That's, the, that's what I've tried to uh, convey to my boys. But at the same time, they believe that some of the things uh, that Israel has been doing, certainly in recent years, uh, has been objectionable. Um, and that's led, in their minds, to a great deal of anti-Semitism on the university campuses, and which is a major problem in the United States today. I wonder if you might comment on that. Look, the notion that if Israel misbehaves, Jews deserve to be obliterated is obscene under any circumstance. It has nothing to do with it. Yeah. Israel is a country like any other that makes mistakes, right? There is no more vocal anti-Israeli stand than here in Israel. We, it's a very vibrant democracy. And as we speak, there are tens of thousands of people protesting outside the home of the prime minister to let him know they are not happy with his policies, with his actions, or with the state of affairs in our country. That's fine. However, that's not an excuse for anti-Semitism. And when the college campuses are erupting in anti-Semitism, all that they've found is a, is a long is an excuse that they've been looking for, to hate the Jew. Just like in, in, in the United States, if I were to look at the missteps of some of the police policemen uh, that have become so public, and now to, to say that that's the cause of, of anti-white, or an, it's, it's, it's a problem, but it's not a reason to hate anybody. Well, I certainly agree with that point. Uh, the, the tragedy that, you know, we face in this country is that, uh, especially among minorities and people of color, is that for some reason they are targeting, in other words, we're getting anti-Semitism not only from the right, the usual white supremacists, but from the left. And that's extremely disturbing considering, you know, the liberal history of our people and the support that we have offered uh, to people of color over the last century in, in trying to uh, get them their rights. It's a very troubling thing for me, you know, having witnessed the, you know, the bus rides and things of that sort in our American South. So I don't think it's, it's a quid pro quo. I think that when Jews stand up against anti-black prejudice, it's because it's wrong. And you have to stand up for the right against the wrong. And when blacks hate Jews, it's wrong. 
It's unacceptable. And that's just the way. It's not because we did you a favor, now you should do us a favor. That's not what it's about. It's about right is right and wrong is wrong. And if there is bigotry and prejudice in the United States, fight it. Fight all of it. Fight every drop of it. And, but but it, it, there is no excuse for hating a people. It just, it just doesn't exist. There is no legitimate excuse for hating a people. Jews cannot hate Germans. We can hate I, what Germans did. We can hate what Nazis, right, who get, but that we, I should go and kick a 13-year-old a, a, a German kid now? What, what, what for? What am I going to do that for? In other words, I, I agree with you we're completely. not going to move ahead <laughs> if we don't get rid of this propensity to hate people who are different. Yeah. And well, we, I think I think I think that's the way to view it. Anti, well, whatever, hate is bad. That's that's it. correct. And I can tell you, I'm a Jew who works at Yad Vashem. If you want to know where unchecked hate can lead, come to Israel. And I'll take you to our museum. I've been there. So okay, I've so been let's an get experience. rid of it. Let's get rid of it while we can, before our kids Thank grow up and have to suffer through the same stupidity that we and our parents and our grandparents and our great grandparents had to suffer through. Mm -hmm. I have an opinion on this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Shelly? Uh, Rabbi, I cannot thank you enough. It's been such an honor and our privilege for us to be in your presence and thank to you, learn Rudy. with you and you are remarkable and you have so much to share with many regardless of the age and i am absolutely uh hoping that i will be able to bring you to our religious school this year and My our opinion. students would would welcome you with open arms well i hope so first we have to get on an airplane and get someplace and be able to walk out of the airport and not stay in the same place for two weeks. But I think we're moving <laughs> in the right direction. Well, in case it's not soon enough, we, we hope we can do it through Zoom because through you, you're able to travel the world and we hope oh. you can travel here in this capacity as well. It would be fabulous to have you in person, but this is, this is a wonderful alternate. So thank you, thank you for your precious time in, in connecting with us in not only this important topic, but in everything you've spoken about. Oh. It's been such a, an experience. Thank you. If there aren't any more questions, um, I also will say thank you very much. It's been really nice to have these two study sessions with you. And I do hope that we get to meet you in person. I personally would like that to be at Yad Vashem, but in the States, that would be good too. Yes. We look forward to, to further, further opportunities to study with you. Susie, I want to thank you for putting this together for us. Thank oh, you. I just hosted. Shelly's the one who put it together. Oh, well, she gets the thanks. But thank, thank you for thanking us, Ken. It really has been um, nice to have these programs. Have, hope everybody has a wonderful day. Yes, thank you all so much for, for joining us today, and we hope to see you again. Thank yeah. you. Bye-bye. Be well.